and woman that goes to war anywhere would learn to claim those promises and put God first, I can guarantee you on the word of the living God, they can come back without a scratch. It is well with my soul. And the first time I heard somebody say that the man that wrote that song, his wife and his daughters had drowned at sea. And when he went back across the ocean, he told the captain of the ship, he said, when we get to the place where the ship sank that my wife and daughters drowned, I want you to tell me. And he said, when they got to that place, he stood up on the deck of that ship and looked out and he wrote that song. It is well with my soul. That is a man that really knew the king. Now then on this earth, if you're a Christian in these days we're in now, I want you to know before I give you the opportunity to speak with a couple of testimonies or whatever, and I'm definitely going to do that today. I'm sure that if you're in the news at all or looking around anywhere in Christian world today, you're finding that the enemy is trying to take everything that pertains to God off of everything. Amen. Well... I'm going to agree with them. I think we should take in God we trust off of everything. And you know what we should put on there? In the name of Jesus we trust, which is God. Now if you really want, I can't find anywhere in the Word of God, nowhere where it says in the name of God do I have power. But everywhere in the Scripture says in the name of Jesus we have power. Now, you want to really stir up some devils. <laughs> you put in the name of Jesus Christ, which is God, yes, we stand. Amen. That's what we need to do. Because I'm telling you, I can see a Muslim standing there. He said, I like living in America because in God we trust. He says, I trust in God. My God and your God is the same God. I said, oh, no. That God I serve and the God you serve is not the same God. You say your God's name's Allah. But my God's name's not Allah. Allah was made by my God. Amen. Jesus Christ is my God. Did you know originally, I've read, there's a man that's still out here today that's written a book, and I can't remember the name of it. I have a copy of it somewhere at home. When I first heard him speak, I ordered this book, and I read a whole bunch of it. And he goes back and checks the history books and everything. And the first original 13 colonies, the 13, 13 states that came to be, you had to confess you was a believer in Jesus Christ or you could not become a state of the United States of America. It wasn't in God we trust. It was in Jesus we trusted and that he was and is God. Well, <clears throat> like I say, you really want to stir up some devils, just start using the name of Jesus. Now something else I want all of you to know that in this day and age that we're living in, I can assure you that before your lives are over, you're going to run into one of the most devastating times of trials and tests that you've ever encountered. It's coming. We're already seeing all these things the devil is doing. I want you to know that you have power in the name of Jesus. Don't say in God I trust. Whenever a demonic spirit attacks you, don't use the name of God and say just God, G-O-D. But whenever a devil attacks you through a human being or begins to say something to you, I want you to learn to say you better watch who you're messing with because you're messing with Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's in me. Amen. And he's right here now, so you better be careful how you talk to me. You better be careful how you mess with me because you're messing with the king of the universe, and he's in me. Amen. Now, if you want to see demons flee, 
Yep. If you want to see demons flee, you start learning who you are. Now, I'm going to tell you that today in the name of Jesus, the power that we have in the name of Jesus is beyond any power that we've ever dreamed that we could have. Now, demons work through people. They work through people. And they will attack you. They will attack you out there in the workplace. They will attack you out there on the freeways. They will attack you everywhere they can. They will attack you everywhere. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was attacked by the devil through Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. I'm going to burn you up. Most Christians today would not even begin to pass that test. Most of us, the devil throws any, any little thing at us that lasts more than five minutes and we fall by the wayside thinking it's not God's will for me to get my answer. But you got to realize, God told us in his word, it is his will for you to walk with him and walk obedient and all power and all authority has been given to you as a son or a daughter Amen. of the king of the universe in his name the name of Jesus Christ. So when you're attacked by someone, don't retaliate and return evil for evil. Be loving and kind, Amen. but just look them right in the face and say, you're messing with God when you're messing with me. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's the King of kings and Lord of lords and God of gods. And you'll be amazed at the people that will attack you that will stop in fact, I, I was in a church service one time, and it was a very unique church service. You don't see these very often, <clears throat> but I happened to have the privilege to be there that day. And the man that was up there speaking was a guest speaker, and he was speaking about demons. And he was a little guy. He wasn't near as big as I am. Just a little guy. But I saw another man that was a little bigger than him come out of an aisle when he said something about demons and this guy just let out a roar and he jumped up and he startled me. And he started running down that aisle and he was running down that aisle in church screaming, I'm going to kill you. Now most people like me had never seen like something like that in church. <laughs> When's the last time you had somebody run down the aisle cheering the church screaming, I'm going to kill you girl? You ain't never seen that, have you? Well, I hadn't seen that either until that day. But these were nice big wide aisles, and I'll never forget that church. And that guy comes screaming down that aisle, and that guy was not intimidated. He just stood there and watched the guy run. This guy's got his hands up screaming, I'm going to kill you. And he gets about two-thirds of the way down there. He says, Father, in Jesus' name, send me two angels. Angels put him on his face on the floor. And I saw that guy, his hands went back like this, and he went down, went down on his knees, and went down on the floor, and his hands on the floor, and he was laying flat on that floor, and he couldn't do nothing but scream. And there he sat, and he said, angels, bend his arms backwards. And his arms came up backwards like this, and he was on the floor with his head on the floor, back like this, straight on the floor. And he walked up to me and said, now, sir, what were you going to do to me? <laughs> and I thought right there, I learned a tremendous lesson right there that day. I thought when we don't go into fear, we don't step into the devil's world. If that man had a stepped into fear, that guy would have hurt him that day. But he did not. And there was not a single person at a church moved to do nothing. That man just watched, sat right there. And when I saw him do what he did, I thought, wow, do we have power. That yeah. confirms exactly what the Word of God says. But I had never seen that. But when you see a demon manifest, it changes everything the way you think about him. <laughs> it really does. It changes everything you think about. And the average Christian today in church does not even believe in demons. <clears throat> but those demons in human beings can hurt you. That demon that day would have hurt that man if he hadn't known who he was in Christ. But that was quite an experience for me that day. I learned some wonderful things. Really, really saw some wonderful things happen. I saw another lady there that day that was deaf. I couldn't hear a thing. Couldn't hear a thing. 
I didn't know she couldn't hear anything, but she was sitting over here in another aisle. And the man, this man was teaching about these demons and the power we have over them. And this is a woman this time, and she's sitting about three seats in from the end. This guy walks over and starts down this aisle to talk to some people. And this woman jumped out of the aisle and ran and attacked him and began to scream that what he was teaching was a lie. And I, I mean, I didn't know nothing, you know, so I saw it happen, but I saw also that woman subdued by a couple of people. And after she was subdued, the person that brought her was awestruck because she said, this woman don't hear. She has never heard a thing, but yet she spoke perfectly, said what this man's teaching is a lie. And he said, oh, well, the demons that are in her that's caused her problem, they hear well. And they were what was speaking out of her mouth. But yet this woman was totally deaf. But that day after that woman was delivered from those demons, that woman could hear. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Demons. Demons are a problem. So, in the days ahead, <clears throat> I know from what the Lord is revealing to me, I know that in the days ahead, you and I are going to experience, we are going to be the group of people that's going to be blessed beyond what even the apostles were blessed with, with demonstrations of the Spirit's power if we're willing to walk holy in obedience to God's Word. If you're willing to walk holy, if you're willing to obey His Word and be led by the Spirit, you're going to see God use you to do demonstrations of His Spirit's power on this earth beyond your wildest dreams. You're going to see these kind of things in your lifetime. Because the devil, he is furious, and he is rising up with a, with a fury right now that's beyond anything we as normal Christians have ever dreamed of. I never dreamed when I was a young man that in my lifetime I would get to see the changes in America that's happened. I never dreamed I would see all the different things I have seen happen. I never dreamed I would be able to stand on, up in a, a second story building on a big television screen and watch two of the world's biggest, strongest buildings fall in one hour. I'm gonna tell you something. I know this is not gonna make a lot of sense to some of you but I'm an engineer by trade, and I built some great big buildings. I want you to know that the World Trade Centers and what happened to the World Trade Centers was a very well-developed and planned internal destruction of those buildings. Did you know those World Trade Centers are, were very capable of taking a 757 in the upper tops of that and maybe burn 10 or 15 floors and absolutely no falling of those buildings. Stop and think about that. Those buildings were hit at the top by two jet airplanes full of fuel that set afire a big section of the building. But something that was very strange to me when the firemen went in downstairs and started up, there was explosions that happened below them. And it blowed away legs and supporting structures of that building. How did those explosives get into those beams at exactly the right place when the buildings were hit in the top by a jet? Fuel don't run down the corridors and burn and destroy concrete and steel that's designed to stand thousands of degrees of temperature. I'm going to tell you those buildings, it was a, over months and months and months of time, it was a well-designed plan to put nuclear or put, not nuclear, but at least high-powered explosives into the lower sections of those buildings so that when those buildings were hitting the top, by radio waves, somehow, they could ignite those devastating things down below so that the two most powerful, well-built buildings in America would totally internally implode and fall right there within one hour. 
Mm -hmm. Did you know that even buildings I've built and the, and the structures I've seen, when you take a multi-level building, the average, and many of them, many multi-level 30, 40, 50 floor buildings, probably 15 or 20 of them in history it, in the United States of America, have burned from anywhere from the 10th to the 15th to the 20th floor all the way to the top. Many of them, 10 or 20 stories, totally burn out. And guess what? Not one single one of them has ever fell. Not one. You ever stop to think about these kind of things? What's going on in America? Who's doing this? Yeah, the devil. That's right. He's behind all of this. When those buildings fell in New York City, there had been such a well-planned, and I don't know who did it. I really don't know who did it, but I really don't think it was the Muslims. I really don't think it was the Muslims. I think this is so well-planned. I think it was just like the killing of Kennedy right here in Dallas. I think that was the most well planned by the government agency of this America that killed one of our presidents because he wouldn't do what the big boys wanted him to do. And when you get to be president, you're not the, you're not the big boy. You're just a pawn. You're just a pawn. So folks, I'm going to tell you what. As a Christian, we're going to have to stop fighting with each other. Amen. We're going to have to start loving each other. Amen. We're going to have to realize who the enemy is and this enemy, the devil, that's out there, he is, a, he is destroying everything. Now, I'm, you know, some of you may think I'm completely out there in left field, but I even believe that all of these storms, all of them, I am now beginning to believe because of the equipment that man has made. I believe they were artificially created. Do you know that I was listening to a group of men talking that was watching the national radar 12 days before New Orleans was destroyed with Katrina? And it was a beautiful, clear night, and there was one of the most massive, reflective things happened and lined up right over New Orleans, and they what is this? They can't see anything. It's a clear night, but the radar sees it. What is this thing? They sent aircraft out to look, and there's nothing out there. Clear, beautiful night. But 12 days before New Orleans was destroyed, this thing centered and locked itself in over New Orleans. 12 days later, one of the biggest hurricanes in history, supposedly a 100-year hurricane, came around and honed right in on New Orleans and destroyed it. And then three weeks later, another world 100-year hurricane. I'm going to tell you, we are living in a technological age today that is beyond your wildest dreams. You and I have no idea. I learned just a little bit in the military. When I went in the military, I mean, I, I was not even capable of flying an airplane at the time, but after I got out, I became an, a pilot and then an airline pilot. And then way back in years and eons ago, when I was a young man, that's been a few years ago, they came out with a inertial navigation system called the Litton LTN-51. And they put three of those things on our airplane so we could fly across the Pacific, or the Atlantic, with or either one, Pacific either one. And those things were so precise that you could set the coordinates up on that thing and you could split the center line of a runway with that system. What, this is years ago. I mean, this is years and years ago. I mean, this is back when I was 30 years old. You know, but that, we took off one day from Kennedy, I'm not Kennedy, but from uh, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, and we flew the Great Circle course up over the north, 
down to Los Angeles International Airport, and it was 11 hours and 55 minutes of block time from liftoff to touchdown. And pulled up at the terminal, and I put the position, the sensors on position to see where we are, and we were zero miles off after 11 hours and 55 minutes of flying time. Now that's how they can take this equipment we have today and put it on an airplane and send it down a smokestack and go right into the basement, right down a two-foot pipe, right down that thing and blow up the internal lower parts of the building. They can do that. Now, you and I are living in this age. All this destructive stuff is coming. So let me tell you, I believe with all my heart that God has given me the knowledge he's given me, put me in the fields he's put me in, to teach you how to walk in a faith beyond anything you've ever dreamed. Amen. Because he's allowed me to walk in that. Just a little of it. But the faith that's available to us whenever the nuclear blast or anything else occurs, if you are able and willing to believe his word, he will protect you through even the fiery furnace of hell, just like he did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Now today, you better learn how to walk in that kind of faith. Because if you don't, who knows what may happen to you in the future. But how many people that are Christians every day lose their life either to a murderer, a rapist, a man that's thieving, that walks in, that kills you in a store, how many people have been robbed right here in the Dallas area that lost their life that were Christians when somebody walked in and said, give me your money, and they panic? And the guy shoots them. They don't have a clue who they are. Don't have a clue. Don't have a clue what kind of power you have available or nothing. I think about a preacher that's on television today that just a few years ago when he was out in California, he was preaching against this occultic stuff, and a man walked into his church on Wednesday night and walked right down the aisle and pulled a gun out and said, John Hagee, I'm going to blow you away. And Hagee, little guy like he is, <laughs> he's not really an easy target to miss, especially at six foot, but he is a man of faith. And when he stepped out behind that podium and said, Mister, no weapon formed against me shall hurt me in the name of Jesus. And that guy stood right there in a matter of feet, probably as close as I am to Ernie, six or eight feet, and fired six times at him and couldn't hit him. Either that or the bullets went through him and out the wall on the other side, you know, and God sewed it up and fixed it just as fast as the bullets went through him. It didn't make any difference, does it, Keith? He did it. Now, I'm telling you, these are the kind of things you and I are going to have to learn to walk in. Amen. Because the enemy today is coming. I mean, think. <laughs> Where are we? I mean, when they want to take everything that pertains to God off of everything in school, everything in ever built in the government building, everything that has anything to do with God. And that's not even talking about the name of Jesus. If it just says God, we want to get rid of it. And what are we doing? We're backing off and letting them do it. Well, let me tell you, the day's coming when you're going to have to stop backing off. You're going to have to stop backing off. You're going to, and, and it may come to, it may come to a physical battle on this earth. I mean, it has many times before. Many times. But remember, George Washington went to war. And if you've ever been to that museum up there, and I forget where it is now, up there in the north somewhere, that's got all that stuff about George Washington. And it's got the, I guess it was the jacket or something he was wearing there in that thing. And it's got all those bullet holes in it. And he was wearing that thing. But he was not hurt. And that's when they captured the Indians, when that chief come over and he says I want to meet the man that can't die I said what do you mean he said whenever the man on the white horse which was in charge was General Washington I told my men 
aim your guns at him and kill him. He's out front. When we kill him, the rest of them will flee. And he said, we all fired at him and nobody could knock him off that horse. He would not die. But yet that clothes he's wearing has got bullet holes all over it. And it was not a mark on George Washington's body in that battle. And that Indian chief said, I want to see the man that could not die. Mm. Now then, what is God capable of doing if you're his man, you're walking by faith? General Douglas MacArthur, when he went over to the Philippines and all over there, when he walked in, when bombs were falling, still shooting, he never ducked or nothing. He just walked right on through. And all the rest of his men, his colonels and generals and stuff, they'd hit the dirt and he'd just stand up and walk right on. And they said, how can you be so bold? He said, I'm a man of destiny. He said, until God's through with me, there ain't nobody can take me out. Amen. Now, was that a man of faith? Amen. Now, see, that's where you and I are going to have to get. When a bomb falls over there right there, do you know nearly everybody's going to scream and run? But we're going to have to get to where that don't bother us. We're going to have to get solid as a rock, in control as children of the king. You have to get there. Those Christians that will get there will be just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We shall walk through the fires of this last time without being touched. But if you're not willing to walk there, you may lose your life prematurely in these next few years. Because we're going to see a battle happen. We're going to see devastating things happen in America. Look at what's going on. Think. The Northeast was flooded. All down through the coast, look at the weather patterns that destroyed tens of thousands, maybe millions of homes. And look what's happened to this area. Some of you don't even realize. It hasn't rained Amen. in months. Amen. We have the worst drought. This area right now, as far as the government is concerned, is a disaster area because of drought. The rains, no rain. I mean, if you're working, doing a job, and you're able to go to work every day, you don't even pay any attention to it. You don't have no idea that the water levels are going down, the, the stock tanks are drying up, the cattle don't have nothing to drink, they don't have nothing to eat, you know, and you don't even realize it because you're not out there in that. You don't look at things to see what's going on. But I am completely convinced that we're praying wrong the enemy which is behind all of this today, the same enemy that caused the floods up in the north, the same enemy that caused the destruction down, all up, down the coast in Florida, and the same enemy that's preventing the clouds from coming and raining here, I am beginning to believe this supernatural equipment that some of the stuff that I even had saw a little bit when I was in the military and some of the stuff that was available. In fact, whenever you find out that you can take a, an airplane and you can be 100,000 feet high and you can take a picture in a parking lot right here in front of this church and you can read the license plate on that car from 100,000 feet up. Let me tell you, that'll blow your mind. But that equipment's been available for us for 30 or 40 years. What a camera, huh? What a camera. I remember the first time when I was in the military and they fired the first uh, one of those, uh, I don't know if that B-52, I can't even think of the name of that, X-15. The first time they fired an X-15, they didn't tell everybody what they were going to do. This was a test. So they took it and strapped it on a B-52, went way up 30, 40,000 feet high and fired this thing and it goes from where it goes across California and the guys that was looking at the radar screen that normally takes several minutes or maybe even an hour for an aircraft to cross their screen. This thing crossed their entire screen in less than one minute. They were blown away. What was that? What is this thing? But it was an X-15. Now that thing was slow compared to what we got now. But you have no idea what's out there. You really don't. The technology that's out there is absolutely, I mean, it, it, it's a mind-boggling. And you and I are living in these days. 
we take for granted too many things and they're doing too many things and getting too much control over all of us. Amen. Now then, you know, one of these things which most people never even heard of, the little RFID chips. Anybody in here knows what an RFID chip is? Some of you have, very few of you, see? Very few of you. Did you know that almost everything you buy in some of the major stores today already has an RFID chip in it, which has the number, ha has the price, everything, where you bought it, the whole nine yards, and if they have an RFID reader in it, and it, if, I mean, they have one on the door. Let's say you buy a, a jacket and a pair of pants and a shirt and a tie, and every one of them have an RFID chip in it, and then you put these on, and you walk through a store or walk through a doorway that has an RFID reader in it, it'll transmit that information and say, these pieces of equipment just walked in and Thurman Scrivener bought them. They know where you are. They know what you're wearing. They know everything about you. And most people don't even know the RFID is there. And they now have these things. At first, when they first built the first ones, they had a little antenna on them that was the size of a postage stamp. Now then, they put these now in our dollar bills. You know, it's very amazing. You can take a, the average, tw newer, $20 bill, and I, if you want to try this, you take a $20 bill, and a new one, a fairly new one, and you put it in your microwave and turn it on and see what happens. That RFID antenna will explode right where the, the picture is and it will blow a hole in that $20 bill about a two inches by two inches. Just explode. What is it? An RFID chip. They got that, that number. They know where that $20 bill is. They know who's carrying that $20 bill. They know everywhere that $20 bill has gone. They're keeping record of where that stuff's going. Isn't that amazing? And most people don't even know it's there. Amazing what technology has done today. And the world you and I live in. Now then, you're going to have to be very careful or one day you're going to go somewhere and some doctor or somebody is going to give you a little shot or a little something. And in that shot, he's going to put one of them little tiny now, they have them things down now. They are only the size of a grain of sand. That's the technology that's there. They can put that in you, and you don't even know it. And when they put that in you, they now know where you are. They can tell where you are from a satellite. They can read you. Oh, we put this RFID chip with this number in the back of Thurman Scrivener's hand. And from that day forth, as long as I carry that chip, the federal government knows exactly where I am on this earth. They can track me everywhere I go. Isn't that amazing? They're called RFIDs. If you don't know anything about an RFID, if you've got a computer, go home this afternoon and type in under one of the search engines. Just tar type in RFID and see the thousands of things that comes up about an RFID chip. You'll be amazed. Oh, yeah, they put them everywhere. Now, this is where we're living today. So knowledge is a wonderful thing, but faith is even a greater thing. Now, you're going to have to learn how to walk in faith because the enemy is doing things to you and I today that we don't even know about. I believe that this technological world that we live in today is so sophisticated and it is, it is finalizing and bringing to the end of the age what the Word of God says was going to happen and whenever it was written thousands of years ago the average individual could not comprehend the fact that two witnesses could die in Jerusalem and the whole world would be able to see it. I mean we read that in the Bible and people say you know this is crazy the Bible can't be real. And only a hundred years ago, preachers would stand up and say, you know, this says that the whole world shall see these two witnesses, and we all know this is impossible. But let me tell you, today, can the whole world see what's going on right here in this room if they wanted to? If we had the proper television transmitting equipment, sure. 
You can sit in your home and watch the war. I mean, you can watch the war going on anywhere they do, anything they're doing. And of course, they can let you see whatever they want you to see. Amen. You can see the storms. Isn't it amazing how when the Katrina came in, they got guys down there in certain places where you can watch the storm tearing up and destroying places. Seeing the devastation. Well, let me tell you. We are living in a time where man has the technical ability to control the weather. I mean, when I was in the military, we learned how to salt the clouds to make it rain. That happened when I was a young man. Well, we were, dim we were messing with that kind of stuff 40 years ago. Who only knows what they come up with? That's just like when the physicists came up with the deal, we can make an atomic bomb. And it's very cheap and very inexpensive. I said, there's no way we can make an atomic bomb. So he gets about 100 of these guys together and he explains to them how they can make an atomic bomb. And they make one. And then I can only imagine whenever that first time they pull those little reactors out of there, not really knowing what's going to happen. They think they know what's going to happen. But if they're wrong, guess what? They're history. If they split that first atom, and this was some of the things they were concerned about. We split that atom, what if we can't stop it? What if they keep going? What are we going to do, destroy the whole world? But they didn't know, so they had to do a test. And then all of you that were alive back in those days, some of you were not, but back in those days, whenever the Japanese was winning the war, it looked like we dropped two little bombs over there in Japan. And let me tell you, they gave up. Because if you can send two airplanes in and drop two little tiny bombs and blow away a huge city. I mean, there's a city, Iwo Jima, Nagasaki. They're a huge city with hundreds of thousands of people. And all of a sudden, one airplane flies over and drops one bomb, and there ain't nothing left for miles. That's beyond people's ability to comprehend. But when did that happen? Way back in the 40s. What do you think we got today? beyond your wildest dreams. Let me tell you, you better learn how to walk in faith. I mean in real faith. You left us dangling. You said we're praying wrong regarding the rain, but you didn't tell us how to pray, and that's oh. been on my mind very much. Okay. Can you finish that thought? Okay, I will. What we're doing, we're asking God to send rain. What we need to do is do spiritual warfare against the enemy that's controlling the weather. I think we need to do spiritual warfare to come against the enemy just like we do in all these other realms because he is the one that's behind this. So instead of asking the Lord to send rain, which he wants to, but obviously the enemy, the God of this world, somehow is controlling the weather elements. And I think we need to start rebuking the enemy to stop messing with the climate in our country. I mean, come against him spiritually and all the people he's using to do this, and then after we rebuke the enemy and command him to stop doing what he's doing, that's when we need to then ask the Father in Jesus' name to send the rain clouds, to send the rain or whatever we're praying for, and then don't give up till he does it. Amen. Just like whenever we know the little prophet that prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years and then he prayed after three and a half years and he prayed one time did it rain no it did not he prayed and it didn't rain 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 and he prayed the seventh time and what did he see a little cloud out there the size of a man's hand and then he said okay it's done see that persistent prayer like that, that's what overcomes the enemy. Just like right now, I want us to stop right this moment, and I'm going to pray a voice of prayer for little Brietta one more time. That little girl has had one of the most intensive battles. You know, it's been, she's been in the hospital two months. She was born a couple months ago, about nearly two and a half months early, and she has had every kind of whatever you can imagine. But that hospital full of those little children over there like that. We went over there. And we're going to go over there again today, probably. But that hospital is full of babies that I believe with all my heart the enemy is behind messing with these children. You know, he's behind all this, 
and we're going to come against him for all those children over there, but for sure, little Brietta Cronin. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're going to come to the throne of grace as a body of believers. Lord, we know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we know that you gave us power and authority over the enemy in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we're your children. We're children of the King of the universe, and your name is Jesus Christ. You are God. You came to this earth and you defeated the devil for us and you, now you're in us and you've given us this power so we come against the enemy that's come against little Brietta Cronin and we also come against the enemy that's come against all those other precious little children that are over there in that hospital. There's a whole hospital full of them that I saw when I was over there the other day, Lord. And I come against the devil that's doing the devastating thing he's doing not only to children but to men and women on this earth. Now, Father... I ask you in Jesus' name to send the angels to watch over her, protect her, send the Holy Spirit to heal her, restore, send mighty angels to touch her and be strength to them just like the angels came and was strength to you after you had fasted 40 days in the wilderness. Those angels, those mighty beings of grandeur yes. that can touch her in faith like we are commanding them in faith to touch her and raise her up. And Lord, we don't want just a normal something to happen. We want something supernatural to happen. We, Lord, we're tired of being normal Christians. Lord, I want to see supernatural things. I want to see you raise that little girl up and make her so mightily awesome that the doctors will stand in awe knowing that only you could have done it. Lord, let her be such an awesome little girl. Let her recover so fast and so awesomely that everybody will have to say, I only got one explanation what happened to this little girl, and it's God. Yes. And his name is Jesus, yes. the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. So, Father, I thank you. And Satan, I rebuke you. I rebuke you over the climate, over the, the people that you've used and the knowledge and wisdom that man has come up with and how you've converted it and perverted it and how men are using machines to control the weather and all these things and all the devastation and the, the excessive rains in some areas and no rain in other areas. I rebuke you over the United States of America and all these foul principalities and powers that are doing these things. And Father... I ask you now to move by the power of your spirit. And Lord, you said you send rain on the just and the unjust. So Lord, I know there's a lot of just people in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and I know there's a lot of unjust, but there always has been like this. So Father, we ask you to send rain, a beautiful rain this week, a slow soaking rain. And then after it's soaked up the ground, send a good one over two or three days. That'll be three or four, five or six more inches of rain. That'll fill all the tanks and, the, and begin to fill the lakes and the reservoirs and bring them back up. And Lord, do such a great and mighty work of blessing that your people, that Lord, people will know that you've done these great and mighty things. And Lord, may you move on the hearts of many other men and women that are your children to pray these same kind of prayers. Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for sending forth rain. We want to thank you and praise you for giving us power over the enemy. We want to thank you and praise you, Father, for being our Lord and our God. Lord, thank you that you come to this earth 2,000 years ago to defeat the devil. You beat him in everything. And you bore our sickness and removed our disease. And then you told us to not sin anymore, to walk holy before you. And then we don't have to be sick no more. So, Lord... I thank you and praise you for this great and awesome privilege that since I've learned these wonderful things, I have been able to walk in divine health. Lord, I trust you. You're my Lord, you're my God, my Savior, my healer, and it makes no difference what the devil throws at us. You're bigger than the devil. Anytime the devil messes with us, he's messing with you, and we're your children. And Lord, you love us, and you're here to protect us. So help us to realize this, and help us when you say, we are such people of little faith. Lord, help us, those of us that are here, to never, for you to never say that about us. Amen. But that we are people of great faith, like the Roman centurion, Lord. He had great faith. So help us, Lord, that we'll have that kind of great faith because you said without faith it's impossible to please you. Well, Lord, we want to please you. We want to walk holy in your presence and in your sight. And, Lord, we want to thank you for the beautiful rain you're going to send this week. Lord, we need it. 
We praise you for it. And I know that everybody in here will voice that over and over this week, thanking you for the rain you're going to send. And Lord, we know you're going to do it because you said if just two of us agreed about anything, you'll do it. So Lord, thank you for giving us power over the enemy that we have commanded him to stop doing what he's doing. Now we ask you to move and send those rain clouds in and bring a beautiful rain to this whole state of Texas and water it good in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, thank you for healing Beretta. Brietta. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a testimony? Just to... Wait a minute. No, no, no. Don't make it have to how loud you talk. It won't be on the tape. So okay. I, uh, oh. This morning I said, Lord, I'm going to ask Thurman that while we're all together today, Let's pray for rain. Amen. This is an answer to prayer. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Who's got another testimony? You got one back here? Brother Dean, let me hand you the mic. Excuse me just a minute, Ray. I'd like to mention four things briefly. Two weeks ago, Thurman was talking about cursing, things that aren't right. And I used to go to a church called um, Hope Chapel in Farmer's Branch. And uh, there was a G theater that was there that went out of business because people wouldn't go to see G movies, so a porno theater moved in. And they had two movies that show simultaneously with this horrible stuff. It's strategically located between a nursery, a McDonald's kids' restaurant, and the Farmer's Branch Elementary School. Well, I talked to the chief of police. I talked to the mayor. They couldn't do anything about it. So the church, we went out and we did Jericho marches around the place at night. We anointed it with oil. And let me tell you, that place left. It just left, okay? And other people stopped by later and said, we were praying with you that this place would come down. So praise God for people praying for the same thing, okay? And then I'd, I'd be driving away from this church down the, down the street and I'd make a left turn. And here's this place out here, this, this horrible place that you all have seen over and over and over. And I said, Lord, and I'd, I'd say, Lord, I just curse this place in the name of Jesus. The people will be saved, but this place will come down. And there's probably some of you prayed the same thing. And praise God, it came down, okay? And I went over to Duncanville to visit my aunt, and I keep seeing this big sign up, Psyche Corundella, you know, one of the main streets over there. And I started cursing that place. I said, Lord, I curse this place. In the name of Jesus, it will come down, but that lady will be saved that does that business. And now there's a place up in Carrollton that's a Muslim center, just a block north of Beltline on Kelly Road. And there's a brand new center up there. The people are going to worship Allah. In the name of Jesus, I'm just praying that that place will come down, that the people will be saved, but it will go out of business. And I'm just praying that if anybody wants to pray with me in agreement with that, I'd appreciate it because Amen. this is the devil's business. And I Amen. say, I curse the business, but the people will be saved. Glory to God, you know. Amen. Amen. Praise, praise the King. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. My name is Walton Miller, and this is my first visit here and I'm deeply touched as the Holy Spirit moves in this group and speaks through him. Uh, I would like to tell you that I've been involved in the uh, financial world both nationally and internationally and I've seen the greed and the lack of caring for other people. <clears throat> and I have uh, been praying that somehow there would be an event that would cause this greed to benefit Jesus Christ. And having survived one chance in 20, on my throat cancer in recent years and three heart surgeries and uh, I was diagnosed with leukemia three, three weeks ago. I would like to tell you that the reason I'm still here is because what I've been praying for has happened and I am blessed with the privilege of directing a hundred million dollars toward people of my discretion and 
and ch charities and uh, ministries that these people could not accomplish their greedy transactions which in this room you would not believe what actually happens on Wall Street and how things and what chance a shareholder in this room has anyway uh, I pray I, in the name of Jesus that I can be directed in the right directions as I need help in knowing where to direct these funds best in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, sure and is. that sounds like an easy task and it is not. Mm. And the reason I'm still here talking to you and I look upon this leukemia as just another inconvenient challenge because I'm on God's team Amen. and I'm doing his work. Amen. And I ask for all of your prayers in helping me direct these funds to the places that can best use them in exponential methods. Amen. And I, I thank all of you for the privilege of being in this room with you and for having had the privilege to listen to God's words through Thurman. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? <laughs> All I got to say, all I have to say about this gentleman back here that's got money, that kind of money to, if he, if he is truly led by the Spirit of God, he'll seek out God and God will tell him exactly where to put that money. You know, I have uh, served the Lord. Uh, he's spoken to me many, many times in my life and I know that he's about the business. Juanita, you got something you want to say right quick? Well, I just want to praise God that we won the one man, one woman Oh, yeah. uh, vote seventy six percent said Lord. no uh, same sex marriage in yeah. in Texas. Amen. Praise the Lord. And Amen. the other the other night, um, a lady that's the head of the prayer team over at Hillcrest called me and asked me if I had a a, a prayer request, and I said, Well, yeah, I do. Um, they wanted to take one hundred and twelve dollars out of my check for almost two years. And she prayed that I would get favor with Social Security. So the next day, I talked to them to find out how much. Was it 50? Was it 112? And they said, well, we're not going to take any money out of your check at this time. And so I just said that was God from Amen. the beginning. Praise now I'm just believing that they're not going to take my food stamps away except $10. Amen. So I'm praying. And it was a God thing. I knew when she called me it was a God thing. It, yeah. I just knew that or knew what she said. So, and, and uh, I just think it's awesome. 76% oh, yeah. of us got out here and said, no way. Yep, praise the Lord. That's what it's all about. Okay. <clears throat> there are still some people out there that love God. Not very many, but unfortunately there is some. But what really gets me is so many of us that are in the church that say we love God, we're not here, we're not in church, and we're not walking in a God kind of love. I'm going to tell you something. This book, if you read this book, it's scary. Let me ask you a question. It shouldn't be a question that I have to ask. But how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? <laughs> Let me ask it another way then. How many of you believe when you die you're going to heaven? How many of you know you're living in heaven already right now? Because you're a daughter or son of the king, right? You're really already in the third heaven with God as a born again child of God. You're already a child of God. So I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to talk about some things here the Lord laid on my heart. 
Father, as we read the word, I ask you to move and do great and mighty things and give us great revelation from your word as we read it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Don't let the things of God slip from you. Don't, I mean, take heed. You know, these really take heed in the things you hear about the kingdom of God or the things you read and lock on to them. Hold on to them. Don't let them get away from you because they will. They will. It's so easy for the devil to deceive you and get you out of the will of God. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast... And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now then, if you're not willing to teach people about the salvation of Christ... And how awesome it is. And many Christians today have never led a human being to Christ, have never said anything about it. And the reason they can't say anything about it is because their lifestyle does not exemplify Christ. Amen. You're living like the devil where you are. You're a Christian. You say you're a Christian. And this is what you tell me when I minister to you. You start having all kinds of problems. You're having sickness, disease, all these kind of problems. And I ask you the question. Are you married? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm married. Have any children? Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Well, are you walking holy before God? Well, I'm doing the best I can. Well, the, what do you mean the best you can? Do you smoke? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I smoke, you know, but I enjoy smoking. Do you drink a little? Well, I don't get drunk but once a week. Yeah. Do you go to church? Well, sometimes. Uh, I try to, you know. Do you read the Word? Oh, let's see. My Bible. Where did I leave that? Uh, <clears throat> have you stopped beating your wife yet? Loaded question, isn't it? No or yes. Either way, you're condemned. You know, but you'd be amazed at the women out there that the husbands are beating up on their wives. And some of them's not just doing it physically, but they're doing it they're doing it with their mouth. They're beating up on them. They're not loving their wives. They're treating them like an animal. And they want to know why they got all these problems. And well, have you ever committed adultery on your wife? I already know. We're in trouble when they hesitate to answer that question. <laughs> and I says, uh, and, and then I've had men say, well, no, I've never really committed adultery on my wife. And I said, you never committed adultery on her, but I said, how many times have you thought about it? Well, I guess every time I see another woman, almost, especially a pretty one. When I see, as far as God is concerned, you are guilty of adultery, whether you committed the act or not. But many of those men will tell me, oh yeah, I've committed adultery on my first wife six times, on my second one 12 times, on my third one 14 times, and on my fifth one, you know, uh, I know y'all are not pastors. You probably don't hear these kind of stories like I do. But I hear these kind of stories. Are you really a Christian? Oh yeah. You mean you don't do those kind of things? No. You don't smoke? No. You don't drink? No. You never have? No. You don't cuss? No. You don't go to bars and hang out? You don't get drunk? No. What do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? You know, isn't that amazing? That I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but that stuff that I'm talking about, that doesn't sound like fun to me. You know what the consequences of all those things are? 
Boy, you better hope that's fun. Because if you say you're a Christian, you're living like that. Guess what? Guess where you're going to wind up? Somebody say, I'm going to heaven. Let me tell you, there ain't not one chance you're going to get to heaven living like that. You better really have fun. Somebody said, well, now wait a minute, Thurman, I'm washed in the blood. Okay, he said, we need to lay hold of these things. I'm going to go back just a few verses to something here. And I'm going to read a scripture out of Galatians chapter 5 to you. I'm going to go back to Galatians chapter 5. And I want you to see something that a lot of people don't believe. But it's written in the Word of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, are these. The works of the flesh are adultery. So every time you commit adultery, you get off into the flesh. And he said, and fornication. Now, adultery is, of course, sex after you're married with somebody else that's not your wife. And fornication is when you have sex with someone when you're not married. But either one, it's having sex with somebody you're not married to. Then uncleanliness, all kinds of wicked things. Lasciviousness, and that's even worse wicked things. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance or emulations or jealousies, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you before or in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you say you're a Christian and you're even going to church once in a while and you're living in all of these things, guess what? I don't want to be you when the time comes and you die on this earth and you stand before the king. Because you know what he may just do to you? He may say, I don't know who you are. You didn't do what I said. You didn't obey me. You didn't walk in love. My kingdom was a kingdom of love. Now then, he says, you really better have enjoyed those drunken brawls. You better have really enjoyed those adulteries. You better really have enjoyed those because where you're going, that's what everybody there loved. But you ain't going to get to witness or minister to none of them. I'm going to put you in a lake of fire and torment, and I'm going to send a bunch of worms to eat your flesh off of you, and I'm going to send a bunch of demons to stab you and jab you and persecute you, and then when they eat the flesh off of you, they're going to regurgitate it and put it back on you, and then they're going to chew it off of you again. And the worms don't ever die. Now, how many of you want to go to a place like that? Oh, nobody held up their hand that time. Well, for the people that live like these things we just read, this is where he says they're going. If you don't inherit the kingdom of God, where else is there to go? The kingdom of hell. So you better stop hanging out in the bars. You better stop drinking. You better stop smoking. You better stop cussing. You better stop committing all those things, those evil, unclean acts, because if you do, that's where you're going to go. Now look what he says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, by the apostles? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders. Do we, is it amazing in the church today how few signs and wonders there are? It's amazing to me that I was in a church for 40 plus years and never one time saw a sign or a wonder. Never. Something wrong with that, isn't there? If you never see a sign or a wonder... I think about the little lady one day that came right here to this church. She came in at Bible study time. By the way, we have Bible study every Tuesday night from 7 till 9. And somebody had told her about it. And she walked in that door, and, and I'm putting the chairs out. And she said, sir, do you have Bible study here tonight? And I said, yes, ma'am, starting at 7 o'clock. Well, she said, good. Uh, somebody told me about this place. And she said, I want to come tonight 
And she said, but I wanted to know if I had time to go get a hamburger because said, I have this terrible headache. I've not eaten today and said, I have a terrible headache. I said, oh, you have a headache? I said, you, how would you like to get rid of the headache before you go to have something to eat? Well, she said, but I took something, but nothing works. I said, but you had not tried Jesus yet, have you? She said, what do you mean? I walked over to this little girl I ain't never seen before in my life and walked up and put my hands on her head on both sides and began to rebuke the devil of pain and commanded him to get his filthy hands off of her in the name of Jesus. I mean, I shook her a couple of times. She didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, I bet she thought, what have I got myself into? Is that what you would have thought? Probably. And then I turned her loose and I said, now young lady, you can go get something to eat. You don't have a headache. She said, you're right. It's gone. I said, no problem. Just the devil. And I have power over the devil. I said, now go get something to eat. So she went and had something to eat. About seven, her and her friend walked back in. She said, wow, this is awesome. No headache. I enjoyed my hamburger. How much power do we have over the devil? Hey, you can kick him out in the name of Jesus. You know, you don't have to suffer. All you got to do is find a man of faith. If you haven't seen a sign or a wonder lately, you had not been to the Living Savior Church. I'm t- we see signs and wonders over here. Jesus is awesome. I mean, not just with me. I mean, many of you pray the prayer of faith for people and see God do awesome things now. Hey, it's all a matter of getting this faith and believing the king. I mean, the king's still in the healing and faith business. He does great things. But it's... It's all, all this only works for his obedient children now. You know, if you're one of them that's out there in the bars, drinking, committing adultery, lying, stealing, cheating, don't come and ask God for something. Chances are you're not going to get it. And for sure, don't try to act against the devil and kick him out of somebody if you're lying, stealing, and cheating, or you got drunk last night. Because he's going to laugh at you. Amen. You're not an obedient child of God. These things of power only work when you walk in obedience to his word. And that's a big secret. Walking in love, walking in holiness, walking in obedience. It's tough. It's a tough walk to walk. It says, it says, God also, verse 4, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now see, these miracles he does according to his own will. I don't know why that I will pray over one person and they will instantly get healed, I mean of a broken back. Or I don't know why if I'll lay hands on one man and a cancer is instantly healed and the other one takes six months. I've seen it every way in the world. I don't know why God does this, but it's his sovereign will to do miracles. Now healings is for all of us. I guarantee you, if you'll believe God, if you got anything physically wrong with you, if you will repent of your sins and we pray for you and we stand on God's word, I will guarantee you every time God will heal you. All you got to do is repent of your sins and make sure you believe the word and stand on it. Now then, there's a big difference between a healing and a miracle. Miracles are at his own sovereign will. He does miracles as he wills. You can't turn him on and off there. When you pray the prayer of faith for someone, I love to see God do an instantaneous miracle. I mean, wow, it just blows us away when we get to see the king do these kind of things. And I love it. And some of us in here have seen him do some awesome miracles. But we love that, don't we, Ernest? I mean, even when he takes a week to heal your wife, that's okay too, right? Amen. I mean, that's not a miracle. That was a healing. But miracles is when he does it instantly. That's when somebody walks up to you and they've got cancer, they're on their deathbed and they can't eat or whatever and you cast a demon out of them and they get up totally healed and go sit down and eat. That's a miracle. But God does that. But when you pray the prayer of faith according to your faith, it will be done unto you. But healings are guaranteed to the church, the obedient church, every time. Now, if you don't get healed then you either didn't believe the word, you didn't have it hidden in your heart, you didn't stand on it long enough, and somebody said, well, good grief, I stood for 30 days and nothing happened. Well, let me tell you, 30 days if you didn't get it, you either got a sin and you need to repent, or you just hadn't stood long enough. Now, what if somebody says, 
But I stood for six months and it still didn't work. Did he say, I promise to heal all of your diseases? Did the king make that statement? If you haven't received your full healing in six months and you know you've got every sin repented of and you know you're walking in obedience to his word, what do you do? Give up or keep standing? You keep standing. That's right. What if it goes on for a year and you hadn't got it yet? Keep standing. That's exactly right. And of course, the longest one I personally have ever seen is a year and a half with a terminal, or actually not terminal, but a, a life long, all of his life disease. And of course, that's our good friend back here, Dave Rosenfeld. But Dave stood for 18 months. Now then, you know, I will have to say at 11 and 12 months when Dave smelt like death because he couldn't wear shoes, couldn't wear clothes. I mean, big old sores all over his body, big old sores on his legs and all those things. At the end of a year, when he comes up and says, Thurman, you've got to help me. I said, Dave, just stand on the word. Kick them devils out. He said, but Thurman, I'm trying. I said, stop trying and do it. He said, you're no help at all. <laughs> but he stood. Amen. And he believed. Amen. And as he stood and believed in 18 months, today Dave is totally, completely healed. And I mean, you know, he's just, I mean, all I got to do is say, Jesus, and he throws up his hands. <laughs> because... When you've had, now, of course, Dave hadn't had this sickness long, only 40 years. Now, 40 years, of course, and his mother has it. His grandmother had it. It was a generational curse. And whenever I made the statement to him, if you repent of your sins and we pray for you, I guarantee the king of the universe will heal you. He said, he can't guarantee that. <laughs> but, I mean, Jesus said it, didn't he? And when he began to get into work, of course, Dave is completely convinced now the reason it took him 18 months is because he hadn't sought the Father's face enough. He hadn't spent enough time in the Word, and I'm in agreement with him. Now he's much, much stronger in the Word. I mean, now then, well, I mean, now then, that precious little child they've got, you know, I mean, he just a little bubble blows in his nose or something. You know, oh, Dave's out, you devil of hell, out in the name of Jesus. No, he ain't doing this to my son. No, 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 no. Out of here, devil, in the name of Jesus. Now, you talk about a young man after he's seen his healing happen. Although it took him 18 months to drive out this devil, now these scriptures that comes to life, it says, when it says, you have been given all power over the devil, and I promise to heal you every time, he knows God means that. And when he means that, he can stand by faith. And whenever the devil tries to creep up on his little son or do something, or, you know, he don't do like most of us as Christians. Well, my little son's not feeling too good today, so I better give him one of them little baby aspirins. No, 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 not with Dave. Dave pats him on the cheek and says, you devil of hell, out in the name of Jesus. Man. And guess what? They held this little guy in the ministry center. I mean, you know, he don't, he just plays and everything and whoo. I mean, no coughing, no gagging, no nothing. I mean, that little guy is just something else because Dave has learned the power of his God. And he reads the word every day. Now, Jesus, give us this kind of power. But something that Dave had to learn, just like the rest of us, he was a, a pretty well normal man up until just a few years ago. And he didn't realize how many sins he was walking in. And whenever he began to hear me preach about sin, there was a few things he had to change. And as he changed those things and started walking holy before God, now then he's walking in divine health. Now then, if you've, if you've had a sickness for 40 years and you stand on God's word and it takes 18 months to get healed, 18 months is not too, too long compared to 40 years, is it? But he stood on the word. And as he stood, he got healed. Now, the Lord tells us here, we're supposed to stand. Amen. said that the Lord has given us uh, these miracles. And he says, for unto the angels has he not put in, for unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. 
For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Why? If he put all things under Jesus' feet, why are things not yet put under him if it's already been done? You know why? Because you and I don't believe it. Who is Jesus on the earth today? Who are you? You're Jesus. This is a mystery that was hidden before the foundations of the world. In Colossians 1.27 Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now then whenever somebody goes to messing with you, Ernest, you tell them you better be careful. You're messing with the king of the universe here. I mean, you look like a man to me. Yeah, but you don't go by what you see on the outside here. I got something in me. I got the king of glory in me. And if you're messing with me, you're messing with the king of the universe. He's my Lord and my God. He's my big brother. And when you get a hold of that, then that, guy, that, that old king can say, well, that old wicked king can say, I'm fixing to throw you in the fiery furnace. He says, no problem. Throw me in there. But the king I serve, he is well able and he Amen. will deliver me through that fire. Amen. There ain't no sickness and no disease can touch me because I'm walking and obedient to his word. So when you get a hold of that and we, the church, gets a hold of that and it's Christ in us, then we will put all of these things under his feet because it's already been done as far as the Father is concerned. It's been put under our feet. But we're going to have to make it come to pass. Why has it not come to pass? You, let's put it this way, the body, I don't even have any idea how many, maybe trillions of cells the physical body has in it. But a bunch. It's an awesome, complex piece of equipment. The most incredible machine that's ever been made is this piece of flesh that you live in. Millions and trillions of pieces, cells and organs and everything else. But yet, you and I have such organic unity with the king, you and I are one cell in his body. We're parts of the body of Christ on this earth. So, if we are parts of the body, then we are Christ on the earth. He's what he tells us. We are Christ. So, you don't need to be afraid of nothing. When the enemy tries to mess with you or somebody else messes with you, don't be afraid. You know, don't be afraid of nothing. You know, I used to think about when I first started building buildings, especially if it was a very tall building, you know, I'd get up on top of the building, I'd be a little afraid. And then one day I realized, hey, he sends his angels to watch over me so I won't dash my foot against the stone. There ain't nothing can hurt me as long as I'm here to serve Jesus. Nothing can hurt me. So now I can walk across those beams. I don't care if it's 20 foot down or 400 feet down. It makes no difference. I am not afraid. You know, it makes no difference if a devil jumps out. Somebody can jump out from behind a door, you know, at night and try to scare me. In fact, let me ask you girls something. If you were to wake up in the middle of the night and you were laying there in bed and you opened your eyes and you saw a great big black looking thing that looked like a man standing right beside your bed, what would you do? What would you do? What? You'd scream. scream. You'd scream. How many of you girls going to be truthful? How many of you would scream? That's what you do. You know what you should do? You should put your hand out and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm a daughter of the king. You can't touch me. You devil. I don't care if you're a physical man. I don't care if you're a spirit. In the name of Jesus, you're messing with the daughter of the king. Out. And you should have no fear. The reason I said that, that happened in our house just a few weeks ago. I woke up in the middle of the night to turn over. When I turned over and put my hand on the cover there, I didn't want to wake up Cheryl because I thought she was sleeping so sound. She sounded like she was. You know, she's breathing a little heavy, so I thought she's sleeping sound as she could be. And I trolled over and put my hand on her. Oh, actually, on the cover there, I was going to pull it back just a little because I was a little warm. And all of a sudden, she started screaming and, I mean, coming backwards 90 miles an hour, run plumb over me. I said, honey, what is wrong with you? I thought she was having a nightmare. 
I said, what's wrong? She said, there's a man standing beside the bed. I said, you foul spirit of hell, out in the name of Jesus. He's gone, just like that, he's gone. That same night, I think it was the same night, you saw the spirit of death. Wasn't that when you saw that in a dream or vision or something? Yeah, it was more like a vision. Yeah, Cheryl saw it in a vision, a spirit of death. And guess who he was coming to get? Me. He's in trouble, isn't he? He got pretty close. She saw him in a vision, and she saw him in our house, standing three feet from where I was laying in the bed. And when he come there, I didn't buy into his lie. I just turned and looked at him and said, in the name of Jesus, out. You go to a movie, and they got scary stuff, you know, or whatever, if you go to one of those. If you go to a movie that's got scary stuff in it, and you're sitting there jumping or twitching, you might as well get up and walk out. You need not be there, because you're opening the door to the demonic spirits of hell to enter you. Don't go there in that fear. If you can't go and sit there and know who you are in Christ, and you're in control, you need to get some more faith. I know some of y'all say, well, well he not, he's not very compassionate. I'm just telling you what you're going to have to learn to do in these last days. I'm going to tell you that every time you step into fear, you open the door to the devil. And that's what that beast is out here to do, to steal, kill, and destroy. I think about this, I think about Stephen that had, I forget how many women he had brutally raped and murdered in America. 26 or what, I forget how many. And I know some of those girls had to be Christians. But I remember the day in, I forget when it was, 1980-something, when he took Margie Mayfield and stepped up behind her, put a gun in her back in a Walmart or a Target parking lot and said, woman, get in that car and scoot over and put your hands under your thighs and if you say one word, I'm going to blow your head off. He'd already murdered and raped and just a few hours before he had murdered and raped another woman that night, this is in the daytime, and whenever she gets in the car, there's only one difference between this woman and all of the women. This woman had the book of Ephesians, only six chapters, committed to memory. And she believed it. So when she got in the car and scooted over, instead of putting her hands under her thighs like he said, she reached up and put her hand on his shoulder, on his shoulder, and said, Mister, I'm in control here in the name of Jesus, not you. Amen. Did that take a woman, Ty? Amen. That took a woman. That took a woman that knew who she was. And the number one murder Murderer and rapist in America, before that day was over, that woman won that man to Jesus and he turned himself in. That's, that's a tape that's recorded. I've heard that testimony. Some of you in this room have heard that same testimony. But let me tell you, when I talk about we have to get where we need to be in faith, especially women, you know, but men too, most men are not near as solid as they need to be, but women for sure are intimidated easily by someone that's bigger or more powerful than them. But you got to realize, with Christ in you, there's nothing bigger or more powerful than you. And so with Christ in you, you got to get this in your spirit. Somebody starts messing with you like that Stephen, that demon of hell that was in Stephen, that was going to kill and murder and rape Margie Mayfield when he told her to get over. She put that hand on his shoulder and said, Mister, you're not in control here. I am in the name of Jesus. And then he looks over at her and says, I ain't never seen a woman like you. That's true. He met his match that day. He met a woman that knew who she, who she was in Christ that didn't fall to fear. And before the day was over, he got saved. She was telling him all about Jesus and how wonderful Jesus is and everything. All afternoons, they're driving around. She said there was a couple of times she almost got into fear, but she never would go there. And as she's telling him about Jesus, she said, we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, he just pulls over to the side of the road, takes his gun, opens it up, pours all the bullets out, hands her the bullets and the gun, and throws his hands up and said, Lord, I surrender. Amen. And she's in awesome. And she said, she said, what happened? He said, Lord, I accept you as Lord and Savior. And she said, Stephen, what happened? He said, I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden I hear this voice. It says, Stephen, this is your last chance. You either do what my daughter's telling you, or you're fixing to die and burn and go to hell forever. It's your choice. 
When the king talks to you, the little daughter may be talking to, but when the king spoke to him after what the little daughter said was the same thing, he surrendered. And that guy became a born-again Christian that day, turned himself in, went to prison, and did die in an electric chair for all the women he'd killed. But the warden didn't want to kill him. He said, this is the best prisoner we ever had. You know, but he was the number one murderer. What was the difference? He had demons. When he got saved, he got delivered. And there is no demons. When them demons are in you, you're in trouble. That's why he killed all them women. But he ran into a woman that knew who she was in Christ. Now see, if she had went into fear, if she had jumped over and said, Oh, I'm a married woman, I've got kids, please don't hurt me, I'll do anything. He'd have just killed her. He'd have raped her and murdered her like he did all the rest of them. But she didn't go there. She stood on the word. She knew who she was. She got a hold of this. It says here, all things are actually put under his feet. But we don't see the manifestation of this yet. You know, I'd read this and I'd think, why? If it's already done, why don't we see this? Because we don't act on what belongs to us. It was put under Jesus' feet for Margie Mayfield that day. She knew it. And she knew who she was in Christ. And she knew her power and authority. And so she acted on her power and her authority. And she beat that devil. She knew who she was in Christ. What a woman. Wow. Yes. I think about whenever she got home, her husband was all excited. He's tried to call everything. He couldn't find out why she was late and everything else. And whenever she did show up at the house, and there was nothing wrong with her. He thought, what in the world? Where have you been? And she said, well, I've been, I was down at Target shopping this morning. And I mean, he began to read her the riot act. What are you doing being gone all day? I've been so worried about you. <laughs> and then she told him. And then he fell apart. <laughs> the husband <laughs> fell apart. You were with that murderous rapist all day and you had to, you beat him? Well, it's a good thing he wasn't in the car. He didn't know the book of Ephesians, but she did. You see where I'm coming from? Amen. There, that little woman. That, and what was the difference? She had the word of God hidden in her heart. She knew who she was. She knew all power and authority was given to her by the king of the universe. She knew Christ in her, the hope of glory. She knew that was a demon in that man. She knew that demon had been defeated by the king. And she knew that demon had to bow at the feet of the king that was in her. And when you got a hold of that, you don't have to be afraid of nothing. You can be a little child. A little child. And you know, little children need to learn this. That if somebody starts messing with you or beating up on you or saying something nasty to you, you need to look up at them and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I'm a daughter of the king. You better not touch me because I'll sick my big brother Jesus on you. Amen. Do you know that'll change people's life? You know? When, we, when somebody does something bad to us, just like I'm a normal man, you know, I say things or do things once in a while. In fact, the other day I'd said a few things, I guess they're a little sharp or whatever, and Cheryl didn't like them. And so a few minutes later, we were going along and we said something. She said, you know what? I said, what? She said, I'm about this close to taking you to the throne of grace. <laughs> I said, whoa, Lord, I repent whatever I've been doing wrong. Lord, I don't want her to come to the throne for me. <laughs> so I said, honey, I love you. Oh, I was, oh damn, but I love you. <laughs> I'll straighten you up, boy. You know, you girls need to learn that well, right? You are about this close. I'm taking you to the throat of grace. Woo, yes, Lord. I'm, no, Lord, I don't, want, I don't want my honey buddy to come to the throat of grace. I know you know what's going on. But when she comes up and says, Dad, that man you give me, he ain't loving me the way you told him to. Oh, he said he's not. Well, let me stick the Holy Ghost on him down there. I'll get his attention. He can do that to you and me, Katie Ty. Yeah. And I told her, I said, she said, you taught me too well. I learned what you said at church. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have taught y'all this. <laughs> you see where I'm coming from? You know, 
If your husband don't treat you right, or if your wife don't treat you right, well, don't retaliate against your mate. Go to the throne. Tell your father. He can, get, he can do things to me and Ty that nobody else can do. Is that right? He can get our attention when nobody else can. But the King of kings and Lord of lords, he can get your attention. So what, what, what's this guy supposed to do to our wives? Love them. Like Christ loved the church. And if you don't, our wives, when they learn how to sick the big brother on us by going to the throne of grace, they don't have to say nothing to us. If they retaliate to you, they can't do nothing to you. But when they don't say a thing to you, you just walk in love. When they go to the throne of grace, say, Dad, I got this problem. He said, oh, my daughter, yeah, what can I do for you today? You guys that are daddies that got little girls, you know how you are to those little daughters, don't you? Yeah, sure. You'll do things for them little daughters. You won't do for them little boys. <laughs> is that right? Oh, I don't, isn't that amazing? That's just the way it is. Them little girls melt us guys' hearts. Them little granddaughters, our own little daughters. Oh, my goodness, what we do for those girls. <laughs> oh. Then it says, For it became him, in verse 10, for whom are all things, and he whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brothers. You are a brother or a daughter of God. I can't think of nobody I'd rather have as my big brother Oscar than Jesus. Can you? No, I can't either. Not nobody. Praise God. Saying, I will declare your name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto you. Boy, that should be easy for us to do. That's what we were doing a while ago. And especially... When we sing, and that's something, it is well with my soul. Oh, that's an awesome song. It is well with my soul. I know what my destiny holds, and I know who holds my destiny. And again, I will put my trust in him, in Jesus. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who are through fear of death were all their lives subject to bondage. Think about what he just said there. It took me years to get a hold of that. When I got a hold of that, I read that, and I thought, how in the world did he do that? How did, be by becoming flesh and blood and dying, did he defeat him that had the power of death, that is the devil? How did he do that? I meditated on that. I prayed over that. I studied that. Only me and God knows how many times I studied that and read that and I didn't understand it. And from reading all of the scripture, Galatians, not Galatians, but Genesis 9, 6, says when an innocent man takes, kills, when a man kills an innocent man, his blood shall be required of him. That's a law we have, isn't it? But that's written in the Word of God, so that's a spiritual law, because the Word of God is spiritual law. We have a physical law that says, if you come out and take my life without just cause, your life can be taken of you. Well, one day that locked in to me. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came from the Father through a woman and became a man on this earth, took flesh and blood. Well, the devil tried everything in the world to kill him from day one. And he couldn't do it. He tried to get him to sin every way in the world, and he could not. Jesus would absolutely refuse to sin. Then one day, in Colossians, I mean in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it makes a statement. 
If the principalities and powers had have known what they were doing, they would have not crucified the Son of Glory. I'd heard all kinds of people say, well, I crucified Jesus. Or the Jews crucified Jesus. Or the Pharisees crucified Jesus. None of that's true. <clears throat> the principalities and powers crucified Jesus. The scripture says Satan crucified Jesus. When he tried to kill him and tried to get him to fall in sin and he would not, in 1 Corinthians 2, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, I'm going to read that right quick to make sure I'm not wrong, since every time I make a mistake when I don't go look up something, uh, somebody calls me back and says, that's not true. I read that scripture and that's not what it says. Okay, let me make sure that I'm in the right place. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 8. Oh, it was verse 8. Sorry, it was verse 8. But none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. <clears throat> so Satan and his hosts crucified the Son of Glory, and he thought that this is the only man on the earth that's ever been here since Adam has no sin, and I can't get him to sin, so I just kill him. I've tried everything, nothing works, so I'm going to kill him. So he did. He moved by his demons into the hearts and bodies of men and women, and men and women took Jesus, but actually the battle was a spiritual battle, so the demons of hell in these people took Jesus to the cross, and they physically put a physical body on the cross, and they killed a man that had no sin in him, none whatsoever. And then as soon as he gave his life on that cross, and he died on that cross, immediately he descended into the lowest hell to pay the price for you and me. And after three days, the Father raised him from the dead, because there was no sin in him, and death could not hold him. Now then, when he came back to life, the devil had to go underground because he is now defeated and destroyed for the simple reason that he took an innocent man's life. Now then, Jesus can stand before you and say, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. How much power? Oh, that don't leave the devil none, does it? He that had the power of death, that is the devil, has now been defeated. So what do we do? The Lord says, now go and sin no more. And if you do not sin and you keep all, my command, all my commandments, you shall never see death. That's a little more than you can grasp, isn't it? That's really a little more than the average Christian can grasp. He even says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, that death has already been destroyed. That's, that takes a little. When you think about it, he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And then when he goes over here in 2 Timothy and makes this statement, this is really, it really, I, I read this verse, there's no telling how many times I read this verse. In, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, You've you got to start thinking like God to grasp this verse. You can't grasp this verse in the flesh. And if you're in the flesh today, this will go right over your head, 90 miles up. But if you're in the spirit, you'll begin to get a hold of this scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's good news, isn't it? Now, how are you going to walk in that? You're going, it's going to take some kind of faith to claim that. I, every time I come to church, I have people walk up to me and say, you know, you look younger and more vibrant today than you did last Sunday. I says, praise God. I mean, I'm on fire for Jesus. I mean, you, I mean we, we had, we've had couples out there that be my age, you know, and Cheryl and me will be ministering to them. And after it's all over, you, we might be talking. I say, you don't realize that guy's my age? She said, oh, no, 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 he wasn't your age. I said, yeah, he said he was born the same year I was, or 
a year before me or a year after me or whatever. She said, oh, no, 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 no. That guy's old. <laughs> she said, you ain't old. <laughs> well, the other night we went to bed together and I said, well, your 16-year-old feels like he's 18 tonight. Because I had worked hard on top of those buildings and I'd climbed around on them ladders and I'd been out there working, climbing on my knees and I'd doing all kinds of stuff, lifting them, them big old sheets of metal. Dave and I was, was everything. And we'd worked hard all day and then I ministered to people till way up in the night. We started at 8 o'clock that morning and finally at 1.30 in the morning when Cheryl and I went to bed, I said, your 16-year-old's 18 tonight. <laughs> I'd aged a couple of years that day. But 18's not bad, is it? You can still do some wonderful things at 18. You can have lots of fun at 18, you know. But see, you've got to see yourself like this. If my king, our king, your king, my king, has already appeared on this earth and has abolished death and has brought life, life, abundant life, he come to give you what? Life and give it to you abundantly and immortality to light through the gospel. Somebody said, well, we're going to have immortality when we get to heaven. No, you got it right now if you know it. It's already here. But I'm going to guarantee you, it takes walking in a new level of faith to walk in this. It takes walking in a new level of faith. How many people do you know that have been prayed for multitudes of times and never got a healing? And then they came over here, and we got them to repent of their sins, and they got prayed for, and they got healed. I believe the word. But you know what I teach you? Like somebody, Miss Bobby back there was saying a while ago, she heard me say on one of my tapes, a, a preacher asked me the other day, he said, how many speaking engagements have you had this year compared to last year? Well, I said, probably a third. He said, I knew it. He said, why? He said, because when you come to our area and you spoke in the three churches you did, he said, man, your gospel is hard to follow. Well, what is my gospel? It's the gospel. It's what's written. But Paul said, if you'll do my gospel, his gospel was Jesus' gospel. But my gospel, the one I preach, is what Jesus wrote, and it demands that we have no sin. It demands we walk in love. It demands we can do all these things. It demands that we heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. That's a tough gospel, isn't it? But it works. You lose a lot of friends when you start preaching this, don't we, Ty? <laughs> we start preaching that Jesus is the healer, the Savior. You lose a lot of friends. It, it, it's a hard gospel to follow. But it's, it is the gospel of Christ. Amen. And in these last days, if we don't do what the king says, many of us are going to die prematurely. But if you stand on the word, like that gentleman that stood up back there a while ago and said what he did, and said that he'd been diagnosed with lupus if, or leukemia, or whatever he said, if, if that gentleman right there, when he gets a hold of the real fact that Jesus promised once you repent of every sin of unbelief and get rid of your evil heart of unbelief, which is in, in Hebrews chapter 3, right down just a little place from where we go. When you get rid of that and you believe that the king bore your sickness and removed your disease, then we can come against that devil that's attacked him and drive him out. And then he'll have who knows how many good years to distribute that $100 million or wherever he wants to distribute. And the devil will not be able to take him out prematurely. But if you don't learn that, that devil will take him out prematurely and that money will go undistributed to whoever God's got it to distribute it to. The devil don't want that money to distribute to nobody in the kingdom. He don't want nobody to have a hundred million dollars. I mean, not, not, not no uh, 10,000 churches, he don't want them to have a hundred million dollars. But God does. And we have to realize who the enemy is that come to kill us and we got to realize we can kick him out in the name of Jesus and we can walk in divine health. And who knows how many years on this earth God will give us until he's ready to translate us out of here. Just like he translated Smith Wigglesworth at 87. 
a perfect body with perfect teeth, perfect everything, eyes held, and not one single thing wrong with his body. And he stood upon the podium that day to preach the word of God. And the Lord translated him out and he instantly went home to be with Jesus. No sickness, no disease. A perfect healthy body fell dead on the floor. No sickness, no disease. Translated out by the king. That's the way I want to go on to be with the king. I don't want this nonsense of haul me down to the doctor and put a bunch of drugs in me and let me lay down there for two or three weeks or two or three months in pain and suffering and my body begins to deteriorate and smell awful. I don't want that. I want a healthy body that when the king says, Thurman, I'm through with you. You're coming to the house today. I say, okay, Lord. Well, let me cast this last demon out, Lord, before I leave. <laughs> Get somebody set free, saved, or healed. Right, Gloria? Wait just a minute, Lord. There's one more man got a demon. Let me get him. Let me kick him out. Let me get him saved right quick. Now, Lord, I'm ready to come to the house. But one more star in your crown. Yes, Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you and thank you for the beautiful day. We praise you and thank you for the beautiful rain that you're going to bring. Lord, you said if we could agree about anything, and there's many of us in here today are agreeing, Lord, that we've rebuilt that devil, Amen. that demons of hell that are causing the problem with the weather, and commanding them to get their hands off and praising you and thanking you that you're going to bring us a beautiful rain to water this earth. And Lord, we want to thank you for saving every one of us, for healing every one of us, and giving us power over the enemy and all these wonderful promises that you said because of these great and precious promises, we should become partakers of your divine nature. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for all these promises and for a privilege to be in the battle. Lord, thank you. Thank you for training us to be your sons and daughters. And Lord, thank you that you're our Lord and our God. And we give you all praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.